Pseudoscience and dangerous misinformation are everywhere. And while science may be our best tool for determining fact from total BS, what most of us were taught about science in school is woefully inadequate and incomplete. So today, we're gonna be doing our best to fill in those gaps. Do you remember learning about the scientific method as a kid? You make an observation, ask questions, and form a hypothesis. You create an experiment, analyze the results, and form a conclusion, and then do the whole cycle all over. Congratulations! Your understanding of science has officially caught up to the year 1265. That's when Roger Bacon was writing about empirical observation, and sure, it's a start, but if that's where your understanding ends, you're about as current as bloodletting and alchemy. That kindergarten version isn't wrong, it's just woefully incomplete. It's like saying that cooking is heat plus food equals dinner. Technically it's true, but good luck making anything edible with that. The real scientific method has been evolving for centuries, adding layer after layer of safeguards against the one thing that consistently screws up our understanding of reality, us. We all are pattern-seeking, confirmation-biased, riddled meat computers who see faces in toast. And science? Science is humanity's ongoing project to outsmart our own stupidity. For most of human history, figuring out how the world worked was a crapshoot. Got a headache? Maybe it's demons. Maybe you looked at the moon wrong. Who knows? Without a systematic way to test ideas, every explanation was as good as any other. Take medicine in the 1600s. Doctors would bleed you for fever, give you mercury for syphilis, and drill holes in your skull for migraines. When patients died, well, clearly they didn't get blood enough. The problem wasn't stupidity. It was having no reliable way to test whether treatments actually worked. But then, in 1665, the Royal Society started publishing the world's first scientific journal. Instead of keeping discoveries secret, scientists did something radical. They shared their work publicly. Other experts could examine it, test it, and call BS when necessary. Imagine if every psychic had to publish their predictions to an academic journal for scrutiny beforehand. The whole industry would collapse overnight. But publishing wasn't enough. In 1753, James Lind faced a problem. Sailors were dying of scurvy by the thousands. Everyone had a theory. Bad air, laziness, not enough flogging. So Lind took 12 sailors with scurvy and gave different groups different treatments while keeping everything else the same. Two got seawater, two got citrus fruits, two got vinegar, and so on. Guess which group recovered? This was one of the first controlled experiments ever. Even with no knowledge of vitamin C, by holding all other variables constant, Lind could determine what actually worked. No guessing, no superstition, just data. Fast forward to 1937. Researchers discovered the placebo effect. Some conditions are psychosomatic. Sometimes people felt better just because they thought they were getting treatment. You give someone a sugar pill, tell them it's medicine, and their headache might actually improve. Not because sugar cures headaches, but because brains are weird. Solution? Give one group the real drug, another group fake pills, and don't tell which is which, and see if the drug outperforms the placebo. The 1950s brought double-blind trials. See, even knowing who got which treatment could skew the results. If a doctor knows who they're giving the real drug to, they might unconsciously treat that patient differently, affecting the result of the experiment. So now, neither the patient nor the researcher knows who's getting what until after data collection. Do you see the pattern? Every advancement is a response to human fallibility. We suck at objectivity, so we build systems that force objectivity, large sample sizes to avoid statistical flukes, randomization to prevent cherry picking, replication to ensure results aren't one-offs, peer review to catch errors, meta-analyses to synthesize findings. Modern science is a fortress built specifically to keep out all of the ways that humans naturally screw up. And it works. Your smartphone works because physicists understand electromagnetism. Your vaccines work because biologists understand immune systems. Your GPS works because engineers accounted for relativistic time dilation. But here's where people often get confused. They'll say things like, science is just another belief system. But science is not a set of beliefs. It's a method. You don't believe in science any more than you believe in hammers. It's a tool that works whether you believe in it or not. Which is why the catchphrase, but science constantly changes its mind, is utter nonsense. Because science is a method. Experts change their minds by using the method properly. It's called learning. 
when we get new data, we update our models. By contrast, you know what never changes? Dogmatic religious beliefs. Most people don't seem to grasp that science doesn't prove things. It's about falsifiability. There is no point where a theory becomes a law or a scientific fact. That's not how it works. The theory of gravity, the theory of evolution, the germ theory of disease, they all are backed by mountains of evidence. It is a fact that germs cause disease, that animals evolve, and that things fall when you drop them. But these theories simply describe why all of this happens. And scientific progress is one directional. Once falsified, a theory is dead. We don't go back to flat earth or geocentrism because those models have already been thoroughly tested and failed. In order to replace a theory, a new one must be falsifiable, not yet proven wrong by the data, and should explain more with fewer assumptions. In spite of all of this, people will say, but how can you trust science? Scientists disagree all the time. Yeah, that's kind of the point. Unlike dogma, science thrives on disagreement. If you prove the current model wrong, you don't get excommunicated. You get a Nobel Prize. Which is why when there is a scientific consensus, it's so powerful. The scientific consensus on climate change? That's not groupthink. That's thousands of scientists from different countries, fields, and institutions, all using different methods and data sets, independently arriving at the same conclusion. When that happens, it's not conspiracy, it's convergence on truth. Sure, that doesn't mean that the consensus is always right, but that level of independent, data-driven, expert-level agreement is not something to dismiss lightly. But that doesn't stop fringe outliers from pushing the lone genius myth. I am closer to absolute truth than any man has been before me telling you that every scientist is wrong, and despite their personal complete lack of scientific education or relevant expertise, they alone have the truth, stating things like, they laughed at Galileo too. Yeah, well, they also laughed at Bozo the Clown. Being mocked doesn't make you Galileo. Having evidence that stands up to scrutiny does. Every pseudoscience snorting supplement hawking crank with a TikTok channel loves this myth because it lets them paint rejection as persecution. They'll shout things like, peer review is censorship. It's just elites protecting each other. Have you ever been through peer review? It's brutal. Reviewers are competitors who would love to find flaws in your work. The process is often anonymous, so they can be as harsh as they want. If your work survives, it's because you did your freaking homework, not because of some ivory tower conspiracy. That said, not all published studies are equal. There is a massive difference between Nature and Science, which are journals with rigorous peer review, and predatory pay-to-publish journals posing as rigorous academic publications, but which will print anything for a fee. Here's how it works. Predatory journals often look legitimate, but they make their money directly from authors desperate to get published. They prey on new graduates, stroking their egos with emails like, we're really impressed with your work, you should submit it to our totally legitimate journal. Meanwhile, real academic journals are subscription-based. Libraries and universities pay big money to access them, which means that these journals live or die by their reputation. If they publish garbage, institutions stop subscribing and they go under. That's that's why their peer review is brutal, and if a study is later found to be fraudulent, they retract it. Their business model depends on quality. By contrast, want proof of just how bad predatory journals are? Well, a scientist literally submitted a paper to one of them about the biology of a made-up alien species from the TV show Rick and Morty, complete with nonsense about Cronenbergs, with citations to episodes instead of to research. And the predatory journal published it! That is not peer review. That is a printing press connected to a credit card reader. Now, if you're curious about how to tell a predatory journal from a legitimate one, you can search databases of reputable publications like Clarivitz Master Journals list. And by contrast, predatory journals often show up on Bell's list of potential predatory journals. One of the biggest problems with science isn't with the method itself, but with science communication. Pseudoscientific scammers are often loud and convincing, while scientists are boring boring, technical, and difficult to understand. Even popular science bloggers trying to get more views and ad revenue will write sensational clickbait headlines like, scientists say that wine cures cancer, based on one preliminary study looking at the effects of one ingredient in wine on a small sample size 
of mice, ignoring the broader negative effects of alcohol on the human body. Then, when better research shows it doesn't, the general public thinks that science dramatically flip-flopped. No, some science communicator just sucks at their job. Knowing this, when you see a sensational science blog headline, you should always pull up the original study, at least read the abstract and conclusion, and see if that's actually what the study found. The point of this video is not to say that science is perfect. There are still issues with things like publication biases against replication studies leading to a reproducibility crisis, things like p-hacking and plagiarism, fraudulent image duplication and manipulation, etc. But each of these problems were identified by scientists. And as we continue to improve our methods for solving these problems and countering these issues, this represents a perfect example of how the scientific method is still evolving and improving. Science isn't perfect because humans aren't perfect, but it is still the best system we have ever developed for figuring out how reality actually works. It's transparent, self-correcting, and most importantly, it works. If you base medicine on, on science, you cure people. If you base the design of planes on science, they fly. If you base the design of rockets on science, they reach the moon. It works, bitches. In a world drowning in misinformation where every snake oil salesman has a YouTube channel, understanding how science actually works isn't just an academic exercise. It's self-defense. It's the difference between being informed and being conned. Science gave us vaccines that saved hundreds of millions of lives. It gave us technology to communicate instantly across the globe. It gave us the tools to understand our universe from the quantum to the cosmic scale. By contrast, what has pseudoscience given us? False hope, empty wallets, and preventable deaths. To me, the choice between the two seems pretty damn clear. Which is why it has been my full-time mission for the last 10 years to combat pseudoscience, misinformation, and scams of all sorts. If you appreciate informational resources like this and you want to help me grow and reach more people, please consider supporting my work with a per-video pledge on patreon.com slash holykoolaid. You guys can also make a one-time PayPal donation. I'll put links to all of that below. Thank you so much, and as always, dare to be curious. But don't drink the